And welcome back to another video here on Wristwatch Revival. I'm Marshall and boy oh boy do we have an exciting one this time around. This uh, this watch is, I would consider it, one of my grails. This is uh, a watch that I have wanted for a really long time. It is a Abercrombie & Fitch Solunar or Solinar. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but I'm going to say Solinar. And it is awesome. This watch uh, comes from... Hoyer, actually, which is my favorite watch brand for vintage watches. They manufactured this for Abercrombie & Fitch, who, as we talked about on another video, was an outfitter during this time. This, this watch was manufactured in 1949 by Hoyer. It uses a Value 90 movement. And uh, I these do not come up very often. Uh, this one I got on eBay. I actually found it on eBay. It looked like one of those finds that you get every once in a while and I found it and as you can see this was originally designed for fishers for people that like to fish and hunters where there's a complication that tells you the tide and the idea was there was these solinar tables that would um, indicate when fish and other animals were more active based on the the move the movements of the moon and the tide and all that kind of stuff the the gravitational effects I don't know how true those things are. They actually do still exist. But this watch was designed in conjunction with Hoyer for Abercrombie and Fitch to so that a, if you were an outdoor person at the time, you would know when to go fishing and that kind of thing. And it was marketed um, both as a Hoyer, as you see here, but also as an Abercrombie and Fitch model properly. So taking a look at what we actually have here, this thing's rough. Um, as you can see, this this thing has been very well loved, I think is a nice way to put it. There's a huge crack on the crystal. Um, it's a little difficult to see the dial underneath this, and that, of course, is a really important part. The case looks like it's unpolished uh, and in good shape, which is incredible. Um, again, it looks well loved. Uh, take a look at the dirt here, just between the lugs. Uh, this didn't come with a, a strap, but I mean yuck right like that's a that's a lot of dirt to just be sort of built up and hanging out there and as you can see it'll it'll come off so it looks like it could be clean but it's hard to say what condition the watch is in inside and of course on the dial without really kind of taking it apart this is one of those ones that you bid on ebay and hold your breath um you know th these watches are are very valuable uh and they are very difficult to come by. Uh, you know, I've looked around for these for quite a while and had to pay quite a bit on eBay for it. And this is the hold your breath moment, right? You're taking the back off of a watch you spent a bunch of money on and you don't really know that much about. So let's see what we've got in here. All right, well, the good news is, is that it's running, so that's your first indicator. You can see this, uh, the case back is signed by Hoyer and also by the company that owned Hoyer, which is S.A. Hoyer, whatever. Also, the movement is signed Hoyer, and again, this is a Vauju 90. That's a movement that was pretty widely used at the time. Um, the main complication that it offers besides time is a uh, lunar complication, you know, one that um, tells you the moon phase. This one was actually modified by Hoyer to be a, uh, to tell you the tides instead. So it uses, a, a, it's a value 90.1. So it's a little bit of a different take on the normal movement. But overall, the inside of the movement looks okay. Uh, it's definitely dirty, but it's running and I'm happy with that. And the parts all seem to be intact, at least at first glance here. As you can see, there's a lot of dirt in there. But overall, okay, this, this passes the first eye test here. And uh, this is where you, again, this is, this is where you open it up and it can be a complete nightmare. And it looks like we've uh, cleared that hurdle here. So first things first, let's, uh, let's put it on the time grapher. Just put it back together and see how it does as sort of a baseline on how well it's keeping time at the moment and what the amplitude is. Again, 
And the amplitude is something I look for here in this initial stage pretty closely because it kind of gives a rough indication on the health of the watch. Basically, one way to view what amplitude is measuring is, is that the mainspring keeps all the power in it, and then it has to go through all the gears of the watch before it gets to the escapement. And this is telling you how healthy that escapement is from a power level perspective. 162 degrees is pretty low, actually. That, that's, not, that's not really where we'd want this to be. But this is a very old watch, and so it's not unexpected. Also, the rate seems pretty poor, plus 40 seconds a day. I'm trying it in a couple of positions just to see if anything changes massively here. And it's okay. As you can see, the amplitude is a little low at 155, and it's a little all over the map with its readings. But generally speaking, it's running about plus 40 seconds a day, which we can work with that. So again, that's not the worst case scenario. And once again, let's get into the back of this thing. And uh, well, you know what we have to do. We're gonna get into it. We're gonna strip down the entire watch. We're gonna clean it. We're gonna troubleshoot it slash inspect it. Look for any type of errors or mistakes or anything that doesn't look right. Maybe needs to be replaced or addressed. And then we'll put it back together, lubricate it, and then see if we can get it running well. So first things first, there's a, a movement ring here around the outside of it. It looks like it acts as a way to protect the movement and perhaps a little bit of springiness on the case back as well, which can help it stay in place. And we need to, you know, take out the, uh, the winding crown here first so that we can take the movement out of the case and inspect the dial. Now, the first thing to notice here is that there is rust on the winding movement on the winding stem, excuse me. So we'll have to uh, address that as well. But there's good news here. This dial looks nice. Like this is this is pretty good. Uh, you know, these dials are very old at this point. This watch looks like it was well worn by its previous owner and uh, actually used, you know, as a real watch here, not just something that was sitting in somebody's collection. And with that, uh, yeah. This is about as good as a dial's gonna get for a watch of this age, and I'm thrilled about it. Seriously, if this dial was all messed up, then that could have been the difference between me having spent a lot of money on something that would be worth it and a lot that would be something I'd be looking to move down the line or whatever. So let's get the hands off of this thing. I use these little hand levers, and the bag is just to protect the dial and the hands from, from the metal. And again, these are special tweezers that have uh, plastic tips on them so that they're a little more gentle on the delicate hands. They don't work as well as regular tweezers because you can't quite grab as much, but they're better for delicate parts. So now we're gonna take apart the, uh, or loosen the dial and see if we can't take that off. One of my favorite things about this watch is the tide indicator is so colorful and beautiful. Uh, you know, watches of this era rarely had bursts of color like that on the bottom, where the, that blue and the yellow, the complementary colors and that cool kind of star design to it, that, that wasn't something that you saw almost ever on older watches like this, and I love it. Uh, it's a beautiful paint on that and it's still intact. So the dial comes off and there's some bad news here for sure. That's rust. That, <laughs> that dust that you see in there is definitely rust. And what that means is that likely there was some water ingress coming through the, uh, the winding crown at some point during the, the operation of this watch. Now, it doesn't seem to be uh, affecting it from a functional perspective, but that is scary. Uh, rust is the worst thing you can find inside of a, a watch like this, and it may need, it may facilitate uh, some work on some parts or even some replacement parts if we can find them. So we'll have to address that when we get to it for now. The first thing that we do is take the balance off. And this is really uh, done for a simple reason. It's to protect it. The balance is the most delicate part on the watch, and uh, you just want to keep it protected and, and in a case or under a cover as much as you possibly can.
So now I can see that this, uh, this tide wheel is being pressed on by that clicker on the left, but otherwise it's just sitting on its post. So I should be able to just take it off pretty easily. I decided to use the, the Delarin tipped tweezers here, again, just to protect the paint on the, on the part. But it comes off easy enough. And this wheel is actually what ticks over that dial uh, at the appropriate rate. So they have to design these intermediate wheels with a very specific number of teeth and at, at a very specific spacing so that, you know, at size, so that that uh, tide indicator doesn't turn over too quickly or, or not quickly enough. Taking apart some of the motion work here and starting to get into the guts of this thing. Again, you can see there's quite a bit of rust uh, present. Nothing terrible, but a decent amount and certainly uh, worthy of concern. Also just uh, you know eyeballing this from my experience, it looks like this hasn't been serviced in a really long time. The rust is a clear indicator of that. And then also the fact that uh, basically everything's dry. I mean, there's no oil or lubrication left uh, from the last time this was serviced. This is a cannon pinion remover. And this is a really handy tool for taking off a cannon pinion, which otherwise uh, people do with tweezers. But the cannon pinion is actually quite a delicate tube. It's, it's, it's a thin tube. And if you squeeze on the sides too hard, it can actually pinch it down a little bit and make it uh, so that it's too tight on the cannon pinion, on the pinion. So I like using that tool for it. It grips it from uh, multiple sides at once and keeps that off. Next, we're going to continue to disassemble this thing by taking off the uh, pallet fork bridge here. And another reason that I think this hasn't been serviced a long time besides the dirt and rust <laughs> is that uh, even like the bridges and things are really kind of stubborn. Um, they don't want to come up and I've had to give, give both of the, both of them a bit more. As you see, when I take off the pallet as well, I wasn't able to fully, um, wind down the mainspring here. I couldn't figure out how I did after I took it apart, <laughs> uh, but not while I was taking it apart. So, um, I just had to let the mainspring wind out. That's not best practice. It's better to have that wound down before just so that nothing gets whacked. But I knew it was coming. So when I took out the pallet fork, I did it in one quick motion to make sure that nothing got caught up in it and it seemed to be fine. So there's a small jeweled bridge on the top here and this goes on that extended pivot for the center seconds. And that doesn't really sound like English, but this little pivot I'm pulling out right here that's actually what the seconds hand, so the big sweeping seconds hand that you saw at the beginning, attaches to. That small tip at the end is what you push the hand onto. And then that is attached to that big wheel that you're sitting on top, which is, a, which is a, on an extended pivot down to the third wheel. Now the third wheel will turn once per minute, and that will turn that little pivot once per minute, and a seconds hand wants to go around once per minute minute. So it basically just transfers that action from the gear train up to the little, uh, the hand that you actually see going around on the front of the dial. So again, with these extended wheels though, these extended pivot wheels, I have this tool that, uh, safely removes them from it, but I found it to be a little bit, uh, abrasive. So I've started to put uh, plastic down to use it there as well, just to protect the integrity of the wheel and then the plate underneath. So that one comes off. And now we're starting to really get into this thing. This is the train wheel bridge coming off here. And we can see how the train of wheels looks, if there's anything that looks damaged or bent or anything like that. And again, all of the bridges are a little stubborn coming apart here. And I, I believe that's because they haven't been apart in many, 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 many years.
And there we go. And you know what? This doesn't look too bad, actually. Once again, we can see that the um, that the keyless works looks like it's where any rust damage will have happened here. And there seems to be some rust on that as well. And we're going to continue just to take apart the train of wheels. And here comes the barrel bridge as well, or the barrel as well. And the ratchet wheel just sort of sits on top of it. That's how you wind up the watch. And again, this is where the rust seems to be, the water seems to have really kind of gotten into it is around the keyless works. There's another bridge here. The other one um, had some of the train of wheels and then also the barrel on it. This one looks like it's just for the, uh, the escape wheel and the fourth wheel. And again, the same issue with these bridges, they're just a little stubborn, but with some gentle pushes, they do come off. And they look clean too, so that's good news. And out comes the escape wheel. So now we can turn this back over to the other side and address anything that's going on over here. First, there's this weird kind of half plate thing. So I'll take that off. And now I'm starting to take apart the different parts of the keyless works as well as the parts that make the moon phase, or I should say the tide function work. It would be a moon phase on a normal Vaju 90, but this one it's tied. And that's the setting lever spring. Again, I'm working on the keyless works now, which is pretty similar to every other watch I've worked on. That's the yoke, and there's a spring pushing on it. And I'm using a piece of peg wood here just to uh, make sure nothing goes flying. Because sometimes things go flying. <laughs> I don't want it to happen here. I should note here as well, this is easily the most valuable watch I've ever worked on. These usually go for five to seven thousand dollars. Mainly because they're so rare and because they're so beautiful. Once again I'm just trying to be careful here to use my peg wood so that these little springs don't go flying and so far so good. I'm also taking care to kind of figure out how the mechanics of these things work so that when I put them back together, I'll have a better idea in my head. And this, this uh, arm here is actually what the little pusher on the front of the, on the side of the case actuates on to advance so that you can set the tide function properly for your area. You can see there's some corrosion on the bottom of this as well. Another indicator that this watch saw some water as that's the area where the other pusher is. So the two parts of the case, the crown and the pusher, are the ones that are most likely to let water in. 
and it looks like that's what's happened here. Oop, that thing flew off, but don't worry, I find it. Okay, so we get that part all done. And now I can look on the underside of the bridge to find the crown wheel, which is uh, kind of cleverly embedded in this bridge. This is what uh, this is what you wind on when you wind up your watch, and then it sends power over to the ratchet wheel, which is attached to the barrel, and that winds the mainspring, which is inside of the barrel. Sounds so simple, doesn't it? And that's the click that I'm taking off there. That's what uh, lets you wind up the barrel and not have it unwind. <laughs> it's also interestingly what makes the noise when you wind up a watch that really like satisfying click sound comes from that. Even though a lot of people think that it comes from some gears. Okay, so here is the watch completely destructed, deassembled and ready to go into the watch cleaning machine, which I will do off camera. I lied a little bit. It's not completely disassembled yet. This is the uh, the barrel, the mainspring barrel. So we still need to get the mainspring out before we actually put it into the uh, watch cleaning machine. And you can see a lot of grease and dirt on the inside of that. But we can take out the barrel arbor here. And again, I like try to be as careful as I can taking the mainspring out because I don't know of any other way to take it out of the barrel other, other than doing it carefully by hand. I have a special tool to put the mainspring back in, but I don't think they make them for taking them out. Okay, this looks very, very dirty. And I got gr dirt and grease all over my fingers as a result. And you can see there's a lot of dirt buildup. So that's gonna need to be addressed for sure. Probably just cleaned. I also usually take the time to put the parts on the microscope just to inspect. And you can see there's a lot of old oil kind of crusted onto that jewel. That's a telltale sign that this thing hasn't been serviced in a really long time. You can see it right there. Also, let's take a look at this rust. Well, this needs to be looked at for sure. So there's some rust dust in there and there's definitely been some amount of rust, but it's actually hard to tell exactly how bad it is at first glance. This is also something I noticed. The tip of that extended pivot that I pulled out of the middle, the one that goes on the second hand, it's bent. Can you see that? It's, it's, it's subtle but I was actually looking at a video of the watch going and I noticed that the hand looked like it was kind of pivoting a little bit. So now it's time to actually get everything into the watch cleaning machine. So as you can see, we put every part in. I mean, there's a couple that we don't. Obviously the dial and things like that don't end up going in there, but basically everything else goes into the watch cleaning machine. To get fully cleaned, it goes through a initial cleaning and then two rinses and then a dry cycle. So it really, puts it through the paces and should be able to clean up these parts pretty much all the way. Okay, so here we go. Out of the watch cleaning machine. And as you can see, it looks much, much better, but there's still a little bit of rust staining or rust dust going on here down by where the keyless works is. So I'm gonna have to just sort of get in there manually with a brush, my tweezers, some Rotico, and, uh, and clean that up because you want all of that gone if possible before you reassemble the watch. The deal with rust is that if you can get rid of it and the part's still functional, it's okay. If it's some staining, that's okay. If it's taken chunks out or if you can't get it to, to stop, it will eventually stop the watch. It'll keep rusting and 
you know, that's really bad for the watch. So as I'm taking these parts out of the cleaning basket, they look really good overall. But as you can see, there's some pretty annoying uh, parts here that actually do still have the rust on them, meaning that the watch cleaning machine was not able to take them out and they're gonna have to be addressed by hand. Now, for me, as an amateur watchmaker and somebody who's always trying to learn about this, this is one of the first times I've had to deal with rust like this. So my first inclination was to put it in one dip, which is the solution I used to uh, clean the pallet forks and the balance. It's a, it's a solvent um, to see if I could use that plus maybe some peg wood to just scrape away this rust, especially if it was just some staining, then I should be able to do that. As it stands, you can see I made some good progress on it. And I ended up putting this in the in the one dip and then doing it again and, and kind of really trying to work it using this. But the truth is that one dip isn't actually a rust remover uh, per se. It is a, a solvent for cleaning. And I wasn't happy with the result uh, of, of how much I was able to get off of this. So I looked it up online on um, the Watch Repair Talk forums and they said to use vinegar and baking soda. Baking powder? I think it's baking soda. I can't remember. The one in that box. And so that's what I did. So this involves soaking the parts. Um, I soaked them for hours uh, in this solution and then also wanted to get in there a little bit more manually. And so I poured some of this powder on and then put some of the vinegar on and then got in there with brushes and tools and different things to try to really give this the best cleaning I could. Because the key is you don't want to put the parts back on with the rust still on them. Even if they're functional, it's not good. So you can see I got my toothbrush here. And it's kind of working a little bit. I dry them off. And I put them back on the microscope to see how they look. And this one, well, you can see a tiny bit of rust staining there, but that's actually pretty acceptable. I don't think I'd lose sleep over that. This pusher piece looks a lot better. That was the one, but look at this. The setting lever screw, it still has rust on it and it's really bothering me. Like I don't like the amount of rust that I can see in the threads and, and on there. And I'm worried that it looks like a functional part, but that it'll keep rusting. And I, I don't want to put it back in the watch like that. And this is really bad. So here's the winding stem. And as you can see, it is pretty darn beat up, um, very rusted still. And my, my efforts did not work <laughs> to, uh, to get it de-rusted. So I got to do it again. And this time I'm doing the same stuff again. And you can see there's a whole lot of this coming off. And I even get out a little fiberglass brush scraping tool. And I do this actually three times. I'm not going to make you sit through it. But you do get to see the result of having worked this over and over again. Um, so this is what it looked like after a second run at it. And as you can see, it's definitely improved. But there's still some rust hanging around in the crevices of these parts. And... I gotta say, it just bugged me too much. I just did, and so I just was determined to keep doing it, but since I was seeing progress, I figured I'd just keep along the same path. And same thing here with the winding stem. It looks a lot better, but there's still rust in the in the divots there, in the little parts. And I, again, I just don't wanna put it back in looking like that. So I went back to the drawing board and did another run with the same type of process of scraping it and using the vinegar and the baking, baking soda, baking powder, and this is the final result after having done that multiple times. Now I'm happy. This has no rust on it, and finally I've got it all the way stripped down and clean. And the good news is, is that this part doesn't seem to be permanently damaged by the rust. It doesn't look particularly good, but you can't see it anyway. And here's the winding stem. Again, I was able to get the rust off of it, and I'm much happier with that. As you can see, it, it's much cleaner. It does look like there's some pretty extensive pitting on the upper part of it from the rust. Um, I can't tell if that's gonna affect the functionality of it yet, so I just need to test it to see how it does. It doesn't look like it's structurally damaged to me though. Okay, the last thing to inspect here is this mainspring. This is out of the watch cleaning machine, but it has a weird bend at the end there. And also, it just doesn't look right. I mean, I, I'm sure you can just sort of eyeball it. That's supposed to be a pretty clean spiral. 
and it's just got a bunch of little kinks and bumps in it. Would it work still? Yeah, probably, but this is a pretty tired mainspring. It's the old school kind, and so I decide it's probably gonna be better to replace that. So later on, we'll do that. We're gonna replace it. Now I've got to deal with an issue that I'm very scared to deal with, which is this bent pivot at the end. You can see that it bends over a little bit. I can't roll this part because of the bend and I want to fix it, but this is an extremely delicate part that could break very easily and would be expensive to replace. Eventually I got out my, um, my, uh, my staking tool and I realized that the smallest hole on the bottom would actually fit the pivot but I'm trying to be so, so, so careful here. And what I'm doing is just gently tweaking it to the side to see if I can get just a little bit of that bend out of it. And after quite a bit of very, again, one little push too far and the thing just bends over and snaps and then I'm screwed. So this thankfully actually worked um, and I was able to get this acceptably straight and I'm really happy about it. Um, this took me, you know, 45 minutes of, it's just, again, you're just on the fine line, right? You just don't want to make a mistake. But with that fixed and the rust gone from the other parts, we can begin reassembly of the watch. So let's get back and see what we can get out of this thing. First, I'll start with the train of wheels, which is going to be the escape wheel here. These ones both go underneath this little bridge here. And you see all the parts looking nice and shiny too. I like that. And it can be a little tricky to get the pivots in their jewel holes, but this is one of those things that you just sort of keep tweaking around with it and eventually you'll see that they'll find their home. And that's what you want. Just another quick check to make sure that these are uh, sitting correctly. And what I've done here is what you're looking at is a brand new mainspring. So I ordered a new one because I didn't think that that other spring really had much life left in it. And when they come, they come in surrounded by that little piece of blue metal or sometimes it's red. And the way you do this is you set it over the barrel and then you very gently just press in the spring from there. It's really easy. And one side of that uh, metal ring around the outside will have a color on it and the other side will be silver and that tells you which side is up. And there we go. New mainspring in there, a little bit of, uh, of oil here just for where the barrel arbor hits it. And we can put this barrel arbor back together. Or this barrel back together. The barrel arbor goes in first. And it can be a little bit weird to, to get in there because there's a little tiny hook on the inside that actually grabs the mainspring and you need to make sure that that's engaged. And again, a little bit of lubricant here for where the barrel cap engages. And this is just friction fit inside. Okay, so that's all ready to go. And that means we can put in the setting lever screw and the barrel bridge here before we put on that big plate. Not forgetting to put on the, uh, the ratchet wheel there.
And it's always tricky to get everything lined up. But sometimes it just takes a bunch of little tweaks and pokes and prods to make sure that everything's properly seated. But before we put on that bridge, I have to also remember that underneath <laughs> sits the crown wheel. I like the design though, it's cool. It's, it's hidden as part of the upper part of the bridge where normally they just put it right on top of it. And along the same lines, the click, the click spring I left on for cleaning, it didn't seem to me that it needed to be taken off for any specific reason. So I took off the click so that it could be clean because it wears back and forth, but the spring's pretty straightforward. This is kind of a tricky one to get in because of that spring, but there we go. And you can see that's operating correctly. And now I can put this huge bridge back on a little bit of an intimidating one, but overall it's actually not as bad as it looks from the outside. By the way, that right there, that's how you let down the mainspring. That actuates, that's the, the click, that's the top of the click. So if I were to work on one of these again, I would know right away that I could uh, let down the mainspring by pushing that little tiny knob over. But again, this is my first time working on one of these watches and I didn't know that at the beginning. All right, so let's get this, uh, this bridge locked down. And again, what you wanna do is just double check and triple check that things are working properly. Now I've got the extended pivot in there and then there's this little, I don't know what this, what these are called, an arm, a spring or something that's meant to keep it in a very specific place so that it can engage. And here it is right here, by the way, uh, this is engage with that wheel that goes on top and then it stays engaged with it so that the seconds hand keeps going around. And there we go. Speaking of that wheel, there it is. So third wheel extended. That's also just friction fit on the top, meaning just pressed on. All right, so everything looks good there. Now we need to do some oiling here of the pivots. So I'm just gonna use my loop to do it this time. And now this little jeweled bridge thing that goes on the top there. And that holds everything into place for that seconds, that running seconds hand, but also I'm gonna make sure that I get a little bit of lubricant on that. Now, I did wanna show you what I use for lubricants. I know that a bunch of you have asked in the comments. There's four that I use. This one is called 9010. This one comes from Mobius. Uh, in fact, all of them do that I use. And I also wanted to show you how I fill up the little oil <laughs> uh, container here that I use. It's kind of an interesting way because you need such a small amount that you actually can just get some on the tip of your tweezers like this and then eventually work it down and then it'll just sort of capillary action get on there. So that's 9010. That one is used for the finest points. It's the lightest oil that, that I use. This one is called HB 1300. It's also by Mobius, as I said. And this one's for the medium stuff. So this is for higher friction parts, but not super high friction parts. 
Um, bearings, often uh, this is what you use for those. Um, again, fairly high friction. This is 9501. So this is that blue grease that you'll see in the videos sometimes. And this is grease. So this is for the highest friction parts. This is where like metal, big, big relative to watches, pieces of metal are rubbing up against each other. You'll use 9501. And then the last one is 9415. And this is for the pallet forks. So this is a specific type of grease that is used for the escapement only. And uh, you put a very, very, very small amount on the exit stone of the pallets. And then that goes onto the escape wheel as it goes around and keeps lubrication on there. And this is a type of grease that's meant to stay there for a long time, but it does need to be replaced and it does affect the uh, performance of the movement pretty significantly. So now we can start to put together the keyless works here. So that's what they call the sliding pinion. And I'm making sure to put some of that, um, that 9501 grease that I just talked about on it. This is one of those high wear parts. And there's a clutch and pinion type setup here where that thing has two different ways that it can engage. One of them is to wind the watch and the other one is to set the hands on the watch. And as you can see, I put it in backwards to start with because I'm still learning. <laughs> but the good news is I caught it before anything went. And now I'm using that HP 1300, so that mid-level oil on some of these uh, motion works parts. These spin on those little posts, so they're fairly high friction, but they don't have metal uh, pressing on them, right? They're not like spring-loaded, if you will. Put a little bit of 9501 here on the main post. Again, you can kind of get an idea for when these uh, when these things are used. Uh, the cannon pinning remover, unfortunately, does not put it back on, so you just have to press it on with some tweezers. Get this little uh, holding bridge on for the motion works. The motion works are what you use to set the time and also what makes the hands go around the ultimately. So this part here is again the part that clicks over the, um, the tide functionality. It has a little raised area on it that clicks it over once every however long the tides go. All right, so that looks like it's all set up and we can focus our attention now on the keyless works. As well as the tide functionality. Again, this is the, um, the corrector, I think is what they call it. So this is what gets pushed on when you push a little button on the outside. And then that moves over the little tide indicator one notch at a time so that you can set it correctly. You have to look it up on a table for where the area where you live during the time of year that it is, and then you can set it. Now I have to move this spring out of the way to get this little part in, and this part actually pushes on the teeth part of the tide indicator part so that it clicks over instead of just sort of being freely spinning. But I have to hold this spring back the whole time or else it's really hard to get the screw sat properly. Uh, there we go. And as you can see, it now is spring loaded on that part so that when it pushes, it'll actually push. Now, but looking at this, I'm looking and going, wait a minute, if I push down on that, then it should push up. So this spring should actually be on top of that corrector and I didn't place it there when I put it in. So I have to take it back out. <laughs> I don't wanna to try to bend that spring. I'm worried that it'll, it'll break it or, or permanently bend it. So I'll just bend it out of the way like this and then get this part back in. But I just need to kind of hold it there with the tweezers. So I'm kind of doing the one hand tweezer dance here, <laughs> which is uh, something I can do, but I wouldn't say I'm good at just yet.
but we're getting it. And there we go. Now that spring is actually pushing down on that lever so that it recorrects it back to its original position when let go of, and that's what it's supposed to do. Okay, so now back to the keyless works again. And this is the yoke. So once again, I need to do a little bit of maneuvering here because that spring activates on that yoke and I need that spring out of the way to install it. So <clears throat> again, I'm using just a piece of pegwood to kind of just hold things at bay and or tweezers. And now I'm using the tweezers to hold it down because I still need to screw this part in and I need that hole to line up for the screw. <laughs> so yeah, kind of kind of tricky business, but nothing terrible. And I have to say this thing's coming right back together. I'm feeling pretty good about how this has gone so far, to be honest. Took a pretty big risk buying this on eBay, but it's the kind of watch that if you see it, and it could be what they call an honest example, you know, like basically a not polished kind of somebody actually wore this watch type scenario. You don't see those very often, so you just kind of have to bounce on it. By the way, I put a little bit too much grease there, and so that was Rotico, that kind of putty stuff that I was using to clean it up. I'm going to put some more of this grease on the winding stem here. There we go. So now you can see the motion work working there and now that's the winding. And I need to put this weird kind of spacer thing back on. I think this is just to support the dial or whatever. Okay, so now we can start getting to the really good stuff. This is where we get to put on the pallet forks and then the balance and see how it runs or if it runs. I assume it will. It was running uh, when I got it and it was actually keeping acceptable time. So I'm not that worried this time. That means that I'm gonna get out the one dip. Again, this is a, a solution that you can use to clean these type of parts. Um, it doesn't harm shellac. And shellac is a, is a material that you use to hold jewels in place on these parts. And if you put these in like isopropyl alcohol or something like that, you know, a different solvent, it can dissolve or diminish the shellac and then those jewels will just come out at some point. But one dip is, is a product that, um, is safe for shellac. Also very effective. It's a really strong cleaner. Uh, kind of scary stuff. It evaporates really quickly. Like it's, it's some kind of old school <laughs> watchmaker stuff. But uh, anyway, it, it evaporates quickly enough that the only thing you need to do after taking it out of having sat in the solution is to just dry it off with an air blower. And it just takes 30 seconds or something. All right, so let's grab the movement and let's get to work here and see if this thing will fire back up and how well it does. So first goes in the pallet fork.
And then what you want to do here is get the pallet fork installed most of the way. And then wind up the watch because now the pallet fork will prevent it from unwinding like it did when I took it out. And what you can do is you can just do a little test here by hitting it back and forth to see if it kind of banks back and forth sharply because you want to see it let go, let go like this. See that? How it, I'm not, I don't have to push it all the way. It kind of clicks over on its own. That's the action that the watch is going to be taking when it's actually running. So you need to see that before you know that the pallet fork's been correctly installed. Okay, now we can get the balance put back in as well. And this is, of course, the best part of watchmaking, the most fun, is getting to put the balance back in after all that work and to see if it springs back to life. Just want to make sure the pivot's in there properly before trying to push down on it too much because that can be delicate. Nope, not quite in there yet. And there we go. Yes, it is running. So that's always great news and a beautiful sight to see. Again, I thought it was going to run, but it's still awesome to see it fire up. And it looks good too. It looks like some good amplitude. Again, it's hard to eyeball that too much, but you can usually see if it's really low <laughs> and it doesn't look like that's the case here. Now we get to put in that, uh, the tide indicator, which again, I find absolutely gorgeous. The paint on that has just the coolest tone, especially in real life. And so I'm going to gently uh, push down on it so that I can get the um, that kind of controller thing on the left engaged with the teeth, and that seems to have gone fine. And I can see that when I push this forward, it engages the wheel by one click over, and that's exactly what it's supposed to do, so that's good. And we can kind of enter the final stretch here. This is big, of course, is putting the dial back on. I still can't tell you how thrilled I am with how good a condition the dial's in. Yes, it's patinaed. You can see the loom has gone dark. That's normal for this type of loom. And there's some, uh, you know, you can see some kind of age on the dial. But again, that's completely normal. And I love that. I know some people like to try to restore things like that by cleaning it. I would never do that. So these are just the dial feet. So you just turn these a, a quarter, three quarters turn, and it'll uh, secure the dial on the front. Yeah, it is interesting. You'll find people falling into two different camps when it comes to restoring things like this. And as you'll find out by watching my videos, I'm very, very much in the camp of, of to not repaint, reloom dials. I don't like it. I love the warm glow of aged loom. I love a little bit of wear on the dial. I mean, I would probably do it on a watch that I didn't really care about or one that maybe you couldn't even see what was going on on the dial or something, but not on something like this. So the minute hand goes on. And again, I'm just making sure that the hands don't touch each other and that everything's lining up correctly. And that means that I can put the seconds hand on. This is the one that I noticed uh, that bent pivot on. And it's funny because the, the, the main reason I noticed it was actually because of uh, watching the filming from this. I had, had it on fast forward. And I noticed that the top was reflecting the light in different angles. And I'm like, what is that? And then I looked at the, at the pivot and noticed that it had got a slight bend to it. I thought, well, that's what it is. It doesn't do that now, though.
So all the hands on, and again, just making sure that the thing is uh, going properly. Now, that looks good to go. This case, however, is not good to go. We need to address this. Uh, it is very dirty. Uh, again, same thing with dials. I'm not a fan of polishing cases. You will not find me doing that on my own watches. I know that some people like that, and I don't mind it. Uh, I think that if they want to do it, that's totally fine, but I will never, ever do that on my watch, uh, like a watch like this. Half of the reason to buy these things is because they have this beautiful aging, but this one has too much. This is just dirt, right? Caked on gunky dirt from the person wearing it for years and years. So I'm going to take the peg wood to it and kind of get into it. And you can see that is a lot of dirt. It's really gross. And this crystal, I don't mind replacing crystals myself. Uh, when they get too scratched up and dingy, it hides the beauty of the dial. And that's why I don't mind replacing them. Now, I will tell you, I always keep the crystals that I replace in case I ever wanted to go back or if I ever sold the watch. I don't throw them away. Um, but for me, uh, a new crystal does not, it, it actually enhances the watch because you can see the cool old stuff going on underneath. This crystal though is done. Uh, this one is broken in half. And it is certainly not going to be usable for me. So I'm going to need to replace the crystal. And I'm going to need to give this case a good cleaning. You can see the inside of the case has some pretty significant dirt and a little bit of rust around that rust hole as well. So yeah, this case needs some work. And I'm going to do it my way. Which again is not, in, not going to involve polishing. But it is going to involve some pretty extensive cleaning. So I'm gonna knock off as much of the loose dirt and rust as I can here. And I notice that, oh, well that actually comes off so I can clean that too. And that means I can get in here next to the thing and then, oh, well there's also a washer in there so I can clean that too. And there's all the dirt underneath. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna throw it in the ultrasonic cleaner. A Little bit of ultrasonic uh, specific detergent, water, and let's put the parts in and let them sit in here for a while. Okay, about half an hour and they're all done. And we can take them off, rinse them off just to get any of that detergent that's left over uh, off of them. And then we can take a look and see how they did. And you know what? This thing looks gorgeous. It looks absolutely stunning, to be honest. Like this case is in remarkable shape for the age and the fact that it doesn't look like it's been touched by a polisher, which is very rare. Polishing is really, really common, but as I mentioned before, we've got an issue here with this crystal. So the way we're going to do this is you measure the old crystal the best you can. You can either measure the inside of the case where the bevel sits, or you can just try to measure the crystal itself. And then you got to order up a new one. There's a whole bunch of different types of crystals available in all different sizes. And you have to decide, you know, which one you think is going to fit the best. I received good advice uh, from Mark Lovick over at the Watch Repair channel watching his videos to order the one that you want because they're not expensive and then order a little bigger and a little smaller so that in case you were off by a little bit, it'll work. So there's our measurement, 31.24 millimeters and I ordered a 31.2. That's 312 is 31.2. So this is the one that I ordered that I you know tried to get the exact same size. So we're gonna just sort of do a quick test fit and actually it does look like that's about right, but we do need to use the crystal press to actually put this on. You, you can't hand press the properly fitted one and they need to be bent in. So that's the crystal press. It's called a rober press, the one that I have here. And the way it works is kind of weird. You, you would think it just pushes it on, but it actually doesn't. So you put one of these soft, smaller posts on the bottom, and then you put the uh, aluminum press fit on the top that fits the size of the, um, of the crystal, then you put the case just over the top of that, just sort of hanging out there. Then you put the crystal on like this with a piece of plastic just to make sure it doesn't ding up the top. And then you start to crank it down. And what this does is this puts even pressure on the outside of it with a post in the middle and it effectively just bends it down, decreasing its diameter by just a little tiny bit. Then you bring the case up until it's sat correctly in that bevel and then you uncrank it so that now the glass expands. And I'm, by glass, I mean uh, the crystal expands into the spot that it's supposed to be. And that's one of the many ways you can do it. And as you can see, 
it's in there and I just give it a quick check. If you can push on the back with your thumbs and it doesn't come out, it, you're good to go. That's that's a good fit. And this one actually looks perfect. So I've got an extra crystal for my supply that's one size bigger, but this one's good to go. And so now we can actually fit the case. Of course, in order to do so, I need to take the winding crown out because it won't go on with it on there. And I use these air blowers to just make sure that there's no dust inside. You can also use a little bit of Rotico if you find some dust that's stuck. And we'll do a, a fit here to see how it fits. And there's this movement ring in there that goes in as well. And by the way, this movement cleaned up beautifully, didn't it? I think I'm in love with this thing. And this case back didn't get quite as clean. Uh, it has some staining that I couldn't really get off of there, but frankly, I'm not super worried about it. So this is just a, a sealant ring, and then here's a washer, and then the little post cover here for the uh, winding crown. I don't know what that's actually made of. It feels like really like maybe Bakelite or something, like really old plastic. And now we're just getting the crown installed, reinstalled. And by the way, this thing's just humming along, which makes me very happy. Okay, so now I can put in this, <laughs> this movement ring thing again. Now that we've got the winding crown in there and seal up the back. I use these rubber balls for a lot of the case opening. It works on most of them. I do have a machine for it too, but those are really handy and cheap if you need one. And look at that. This thing is stunning. As you can see, when I push this, it ticks over the tight indicator by one notch each time. And I love this watch. I, I feel like I got so lucky finding this on eBay and having it be legit with original parts and everything. And I got a brand new strap for it too. That's right, I'm giving it the full treatment here. I got this from Boulong & Sons, which is a European-based strap company, but I love their straps. And by the way, no, this isn't a paid thing or anything. I just, uh, <clears throat> I just happen to have had a lot of really good success with their straps. I think they're gorgeous and they've lasted me for years at leather straps. And you know, leather straps do wear out at some point. So yes, I do, I do recommend their straps. If you want really high quality for not insane prices, they're not cheap by any stretch. You know, they're, I don't know, 90 bucks or something, but you can pay 250 for these things. So uh, these are kind of the upper mid range, I would call it, but I love them. And I picked out this one for this watch and I think it is absolutely gorgeous. That does, of course, leave us one more thing. We got to see how it's running. And right away, you'll notice the amplitude. 239 degrees up from 150, 160 or whatever it was before. Much, much better. And the timing's actually pretty good too. Um, plus four seconds, plus one seconds, plus two seconds. Now the beat error is 1.7 milliseconds off, which likely won't affect the timing of the watch, but is something I'd like to address down the line just for longevity. So that's it. That's what it looked like before. Real beat up. Uh, <laughs> Terrible crystal, tons of dirt, needed some tender loving care. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and you're going to see the after pictures or after videos in just a minute. But I have to say, I am absolutely thrilled with this watch. I have been wearing it every day since I got this, this thing finished. And it is gorgeous. It, especially for a watch of his age, has absolutely lived up to what I thought it would be. Um, it cleaned up beautifully. It wears beautifully. It's got a really cool pop of color from a, and it's got a really neat story behind it too, which is one of the, my favorite things about watches is, you know, if somebody goes, Hey, what kind of watch is that? You can explain to them, well, this is, this is why this is cool. And this is why this interests me. And this is one of those type of watches. Absolutely stunning watch. Uh, really just a pleasure to own and wear and super fun to uh, have restored as well. 
I want to say thank you, by the way, for uh, watching the video and hanging out with me uh, for, for making these videos. I started the channel not that long ago, and all of a sudden, uh, a lot of you are hanging out and watching, and I'm really happy about it because this is a hobby and a thing that I really find awesome, and I love to share those type of things and the things that I find awesome about it with you, and I'm really glad that you're here for the ride. Uh, if you're new to the channel and you want to get updates about when new videos go up, you can uh, click the uh, subscribe button with a little bell icon. And uh, if you um, want to find updates on my projects while in between videos going up, you can follow me on Instagram. It's wristwatch underscore revival. Thanks again for hanging out. We'll see you there and we'll see you next time.